Hey everyone, before this review begins, I would like to thank you for watching it, but while I usually don't do this for my videos, due to the context of the game and its director and writer, I have put trigger warnings and time codes down in the description below. The ESRB page has also been linked if you want more detail about scenes, though not all of them are included. But once again, thank you all for watching the video, and I hope you like it. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Pixel Punch. Today's episode is going to be a bit different than my last episode, which was... Um... Anyway, today we'll be watching a movie. Wait, that's not... that's not a movie? Are you goddamn serious? A while ago in my top 10 E3 games of 2017 video, I gave some minor praise to David Cage, the director of literally every game at Quantic Dream. However, I'm honestly gonna reel that praise back from the sea of fuckery. David Cage does have some talent which you can see in the tech demos, the casting, and Kara, but his long-term projects tend to fall flat, be laughable, or downright offensive. Detroit Become Human is currently the only narrative game from Quantic Dream I haven't played, but honestly from what I've seen, it's not worth it to me. Except for Connor and Mr. Krabs. Connor! The fuck are you doing? Coming, Lieutenant. Beyond Two Souls is just kind of boring and pretty offensive towards the end, but that's for another video. Fahrenheit Indigo Prophecy straight up becomes a comedy once Lucas turns Super Saiyan. And Omicron... Well, we don't talk about Omicron. Welcome in Omicron. And then there's the one good game by Quantic Dream, Heavy Rain. I played a bit of it a while ago and only recently played through the entire game after getting it on the PlayStation Store. You want to know my feelings about it? No. I have never played a game so overrated, so ego-stroking, and with so many plot holes before. And these button prompts with walking hardly count as gameplay. And if you're wondering, no. The graphics do not hold up. At all. Unlike previous reviews, this will be split into three sections. The technical aspect, the bloated story, and then the nightmare that is David Cage. And if he doesn't like it, whatever. I don't give a fuck. So, without further ado, let's talk about Heavy Rain. Why do I always take my own grave? Video memo recording, Agent 47023, Nam and Jaden, Tuesday, October 4th, 2011. Time is... 2006 was pretty big for Quantic Dream despite no video game release. The tech demo The Casting, which I highly suggest you watch, is one of their better works and was also technically the announcement of the actual game. David wrote, holy shit, 2000 pages for the script, and casting began. Some of the actors did a fine job with what they were given, but others could have done way better in my opinion. Also, Quantic Dream mostly hired actors from Europe, most likely because it was cheaper, but hey, they got a lot of American actors for Beyond and Detroit, so what the fuck? The entire game's acting was filmed through scanning and motion capture, which took a grueling 230 days to do. You can actually check out a lot of the behind the scenes stuff in the game, so there's one plus. However, just because a game is technically impressive doesn't mean it will be good. The motion cap is pretty decent, but... Um, 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 um. The graphics have dated pretty poorly, especially when you look at games even before 2010, and the controls. Oh dear, the controls. The game has a lot of walking, and walking, and walking, and then quick time events mofo! However, the controls are fucked in many ways. First off, R2 to walk. It's stupid. Second, the fixed camera angles don't really help the cumbersome walking. Third, moving the right stick slowly is never consistent. I swear during this part, I was going as slow as possible because it was like, Bitch, you're moving too fast. I wasn't fast at all, this game is a shit pile. The game also seemed to not register me holding some buttons occasionally. Thankfully, because of that, I could restart the chapter fair and square because it wasn't my fault. Fucking judge me. And finally, the tilting controls. 
Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And move controls... <laughs> uh, no. Aside from the controls, giving the player complete control can lead to some unintentionally hilarious moments. This is kind of a weakness of all Quantic Dream games, but Heavy Rain was the start. And the voice acting is extremely hit or miss. It will be seen throughout the review, but first, why the fuck can no one pronounce origami right? An origami figure. The origami killer. A small origami figure. The origami killer. The origami killer. I'm the origami killer. 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 Do you think the origami killer so, technologically, does Heavy Rain hold up? <laughs> you serious? You lied to me, Madison! All this time, you fucking lied to me! I thought you wanted to help me, but you're only thinking of writing a fucking book?! And now, we get to the heavily praised story of the game, written by David Cage himself. Oh, did I say heavily praised? I meant horribly flawed. I have no idea why this is considered one of the best video game stories of all time. Logic is constantly thrown out the window, plot holes pop up left and right, and honestly, it's just... bad. This is a problem with all of Quantic Dream's projects, but it seems to be ignored most of the time for this game. But let's not beat around the bush any longer and get into the meat of Heavy Rain. We start the game by waking up as Ethan Mars, a father of two young boys, Sean and Jason, and married to... Uh, uh, Grace is her name? She's actually not in story much, so don't blame me. The first 15 to 20 minutes are spent getting ready... That is a bud and fucking around. I know that QD is trying to make the tutorial immersive, but it honestly just doesn't work. These two are assholes. An undetermined amount of time later, the family goes to the mall. Of course, because Jason couldn't listen to his father for one minute, we enter the land of memes. Jason! And because Jason can't listen at all, he ends up dead. Yeah, I'm not moved. First off, if any of them died, it would have been Ethan since he's the one actually facing the car. And secondly, the car stopped in front of them right before the impact. The most they should have gotten would have been minor scrapes. But because drama, Jason dies. Fucking little prick. I am wet because sadness. Two years after the accident, Ethan and Grace have separated and Sean lives with his dad in this small apartment. And let me say, Ethan really gets the short end of the stick here. Everyone treats him like shit for trying to save his son. Later in the game, Sean is like, It's not your fault Jason died. But his tone of voice says otherwise. Ethan isn't my favorite character in the game, but he doesn't deserve his beratement. Is that a word? I'm tripping balls, man. After being a good or bad father, it's Sean. Yes, that is an option. Ethan blacks out and wakes up at Carnaby Corner, holding an origami figure in his hand. Oh my fucking god, this is totally a good red herring. Too bad it's mentioned just four times in the game and seen only twice. Originally, these blackouts were a supernatural element where Ethan and the origami killer's minds were linked during the incident at the mall. Ethan would enter this state where he would swim around the environment after it filled with water. He would then find the origami killer's latest victim and wake up, pulling an origami figure from the blackout. Now, why weren't these present in the game despite making these incidents make sense? Because they made the story too complicated, her her her. They weren't complicated at all, if anything, they made it less complicated. But David Cage will be David Cage. Next chapter introduces us to Scott Shelby, a private detective who is questioning the parents of the origami killer's previous victims. That won't bring back bad memories at all. We also get introduced to Lauren Winter, who is honestly one of my favorite characters in the game. She's smart, doesn't hold back, and is just a great protagonist overall. Too bad she isn't playable. After questioning Lauren and getting kicked out or leaving, 
One of Lauren's ex-clients comes into her room. This asthma thing is totally going to be important. The player has a choice to save Lauren from being abused and possibly raped, or you can... Walk away. What the fuck? The fight between Scott and Troy also introduces the QTEs in the game. No wait, that was in the first chapter. This segment ends with Scott leaving. Exciting. Next up we play as Agent Nam and Jaden, FBI. Where we investigate the crime scene of the most recent killing. Unpopular opinion, but Norman is my favorite character. I love using Ari to find clues, putting the puzzle pieces together, and his flaws feel more genuine than the other characters. It's probably my inner Professor Layton coming out. There is one point where using his drug addiction actually helps progress his story. Don't do drugs. We also meet Lieutenant Carter Blake, the lead investigator on the origami killer case. Here be an asshole. After finding out the victim is Jeremy Bowles and getting many other clues, the chapter ends. Ethan goes to his therapist and what the fuck is this gadgetry? This chapter, despite being so small, actually infuriates me. First off, David Cage has no idea what schizophrenia is and is confusing it with disassociative identity disorder. Either way, good job with your treatment of mental illness, David. That was sarcasm. Also, you do not tell the man who lost his son he is lucky for being alive. You are a horrible therapist. After this, Ethan and Sean hang out at the park where they actually have a good moment bonding. I actually freaking like this scene. But of course, Ethan blacks out while Sean is on the carousel. In the original cut, this scene was so much more impactful because a tsunami came in, symbolizing Ethan's life was about to fall apart. Why? I know David is trying to get me to feel something, but with how poorly the story is put together, I just don't care. To be frank with you, I could have done without the FBI on this one, but the press are all over us. This origami killer case crept up on us, and it's fast becoming a national concern. Okay, I will admit this holographic desk area is a little stupid. After reviewing our evidence in our closet, no, really. This? This is my office? And avoiding a withdrawal episode, we switch to Ethan reporting Sean's disappearance. Why did you leave him, Ethan? Why? Wasn't it enough losing Jason? Girl, oh my god. Back with Scott, we interview another origami killer's victim's parent, Hassan, who refuses to help us at first, but then cooperates when we save him from a robber. Although... It turns out Hassan didn't really investigate the box much, so... Next up, we play as... Oh, God. So, this is Madison Page, a journalist who's an insomniac, and only there to be David Cage's fetish material. Seriously, there are 52 chapters in Heavy Rain, 17 are played as Ethan, 14 as Scott, 12 as Norman, and a whole whopping total of 9 as Madison. And this is about two hours into the game, David, you can't just throw in a new main character like that. And she doesn't serve any purpose besides being sexually assaulted or nursing Ethan back to health. Oh, and the sexual assault isn't just once. Oh no. Madison can get put in danger sexually three fucking times. And one of them, while avoidable, is pretty fucked up. Let's just say I do not want to meet David Cage in person. So... Running on a computer, showering, going to the... What the fuck? And defending yourself in a QTE action scene. Oh, it was a nightmare. Wait, what? Speaking of Ethan, by the way, after being mailed a letter as well as a train ticket and escaping the paparazzi, he heads to Lexington Station. I actually don't mind the beginning of this chapter as the agoraphobia Ethan has developed makes sense. But then David ruins it with... Jason! Turns out, in one of the lockers is a shoebox of our own. Back in motel, Ethan checks an SD card and puts it into a phone, where there's a video of Sean drowning. Help! Dad! Sean! Where are you? I'm so cold! Dad! Dad! Oh, help me, Dad. I'm totally scared and in peril. He then opens the first of five origami figures and gets him addressed. 
Finally, the meat of the story begins, and we're back to... Agent Norman Jaden, FBI. Like I said earlier, Norman is my favorite character, but damn, that was a horrific cut. Anyway, Norman explains to the police department the evidence he's gathered from the crime scene, and Blake decides to be a child. Fucking asshole! That Norman estimates that they have about 72 hours before Sean drowns, but what if the weather changes? It would need to be a constant for that, and even still, it's rainwater. It would need to be really fucking heavy to drown him that fast. Norman proposes two suspects that could be the killer, neither of which fit the description he gave. We head to the first suspect's house, and as if it wasn't clear already, Blake is quite the dirty cop. I'm not sure that's entirely legal. Nathaniel arrives while we're searching, and Blake is a fucking asshole! That we manage to defuse the situation despite David trying to trick us. Ha. Huh. Ha. Huh. Scott visits the home of Jeremy Bowles, the most recent victim, and saves his mother from a suicide attempt. After taking care of Susan and her baby, we find out that Jeremy's father just disappeared, but left a phone that doesn't work. She allows us to take it as evidence, and we leave, which brings us to Ethan starting the first trial at a garage. So, this car was just sitting here for a couple of years? If this car wasn't taken out or repaired, it would be in really bad shape. Technical issues aside, Ethan takes the car out and gets a really solid line, actually. Are you ready to show your courage in order to save your son? Now, this is the one complaint I actually don't agree with. I think the fact an unnatural message comes from a GPS is what makes it effective. Anyway though, Ethan must drive 5 miles down the highway in 5 minutes going the wrong way. Easy peasy- OH SHIT! Once Ethan completes the trial and escapes the burning car, he gets another SD card, oh no my son is drowning, and gets the first few letters of the address where Sean is at. This leads directly into the next chapter, where Madison checks into the same hotel and meets Ethan. She helps him get back to his room, nurses him back to health, snoops through his belongings, and leaves after a short conversation. I wish I was joking. After Madison is gone, Ethan opens up the second origami figure and heads to the next location. This chase scene isn't that hard unless you fuck up once, then hilarity ensues. Why'd he tackle it? Back on Scott's side, Lauren comes to his place and hands him a letter, which he finds interesting since it was written on an old typewriter. And by now, you've probably figured out the twist because it is literally right in front of you. Lauren won't let him keep the letter unless she is allowed to investigate with him, which he reluctantly agrees to. They head to the house of a suspect, Gordy Kramer, and intrude on his party. Scott is sexist, Lauren is smart, and then he confronts Gordy. Very well. I'm the origami killer. There is only one are you imbecile. After being thrown out, Ethan begins the second trial. Forgetting the fact that setting this up is impossible, Ethan must slowly navigate a maze of broken glass before traversing through these live electrical condensers, oh my god. Also, this power plant was abandoned. I wonder what strings the origami killer had to pull to get this to work. Ethan gets another video of his son drowning, and more letters to the address. The next chapter is pretty much a repeat of the first time Madison nursed him back to health, minus the snooping. After she awkwardly leaves, Ethan opens up the third figure and heads to the next trial. This chapter does nothing! Oh, and Grace makes her last appearance, and tries to make Ethan look like he's the origami killer. We'd like to ask you a few questions about him. I'm sorry, that's impossible. Okay then. Ethan Mars has had psychological problems since his first son died. But you just said... Ethan Mars is the origami killer. Can no one pronounce origami right? Scott meets with Charles Kramer, Gordy's father, to interrogate him. The chapter ends with Charles offering to pay Scott to keep quiet, then threatening him. Add that to the pile of unneeded chapters in a David Cage game. This chapter is actually pretty good. Ethan enters his abandoned apartment building and finds a key in a porcelain lizard. He arrives at the lizard trial and finds a tablet on the table. Are you prepared to suffer to save your son? You have five minutes to cut off the last section of one of your fingers in front of the camera. If you succeed, you will get your reward. 
The combination of the facial capture, music, and consequence makes this a great moment. This is probably the only scene where the motion capture has completely held up. The darting of the eyes, the realization, it's perfect. After this, you can find things to lessen the pain, help Ethan bear through it, and cauterize the wound. And the screams of pain are honestly pretty damn realistic. Ethan then gets the next few letters of the address and stumbles out of the apartment. Unfortunately, after this, we get... Fuck. Madison, Norman, and Blake have apparently all followed Ethan to his apartment. How? <coughs> Madison goes in and helps Ethan escape as the cops start to pursue us. We then cross the street and go into the subway to try and catch a train. They try to make this chapter very intense with it being a police chase and Ethan's agoraphobia, but it's so fucking easy I wasn't scared in the slightest. Back at the hotel, Ethan confides in Madison and explains he doesn't know if he's the killer or not. Well, you might be murdering small children, but I'm gonna trust you anyway. Ethan then opens the fourth origami figure and heads back out. Literally, this man only sleeps when he's near death. Back with Agent Nam and Jaden, FBI. We play the piano. And I, uh, um. Okay, this part was pretty cool, to be honest. Norman feels frustrated and doesn't think Ethan is the killer after looking through all the evidence he's collected. Yes, the very little evidence. I have the faintest fucking idea. Norman suffers from his second tryptocaine withdrawal and, oh my, the lag. Back with Scott and Lauren, they visit Manfred, an antique repair shop owner, to try and identify the typewriter that the killer used. It's not like we already know what it is. He offers to get a list of customers for that exact typewriter and then is killed. We then wipe off all our fingerprints, get arrested because the game is shit and broken, and then Lauren and Scott have a fight. After some pondering and more rain, they make up. We come back to Ethan beginning the shark trial. QC time again! After cornering the man in his daughter's room, we have to choose whether to shoot him or not. Shooting him will give you the letters, while failing to won't. I'm a father too. But I'm no killer. Ethan, what was that punch? And suddenly, David Cage decides that Madison should be more active in the story. Originally, Madison was going to have more chapters where she would go to her office for a job, and that would have made this make so much more sense. Madison gets a tip from one of her co-workers that this man, Adrian Baker, rented the apartment the lizard trial was in to someone. Madison, no, don't do that, it isn't safe, oh, well, okay then. Turns out the doctor is a creep and wants to fuck Madison. This is another one of the scenes where Madison can be sexually assaulted or killed, but thankfully, I don't drink and find the evidence I needed by snooping. <laughs> Meanwhile, Agent Nam and Jaden. FBI is investigating Mad Jack, an ex-criminal who sold a car to the origami killer. Oh, score! More investigating! Oh shit, more QTE. After getting the advantage on Mad Jack, you can manage to interrogate him by... Damn! You out of your motherfucking mind, man? Oh shit, Jack! Ain't nothing to it, just a little bit of self-defense. Page one of the police manual. Kill or be killed. D does... Does David Cage proofread his work? After taking some trip to Kane because fuck this noise, Mad Jack gets arrested by Norman. Scott and Lauren return to the apartment where Lauren starts to become the lead investigator and the two manage to find the name of the killer by comparing Manfred's Clyde list to a list of subscriptions to an origami magazine. Okay then. They find out though that the name belongs to a kid who is dead called John Shepard and wait what okay? So now we're playing as French kids. What are we gonna do? It's pouring rain. No chance, I can do it alright. Just you watch. We play as John's nameless brother and play some pointless games. Then they start playing hide and seek and John starts drowning in a water pipe. Why would you even hide in there? As Scott and Lauren leave, they see Charles Kramer drop flowers off at John's grave. There's so many red herrings that I won't need to go to the store for a month. And now we go from dead kids to drugs and alcohol. Mm, yes, just need to wrestle my hair, tear this perfectly good skirt. Oh, this lipstick is fucking red, but damn, I'm sexy. Welcome to Dance Dance Revolution. Heavy rain style, motherfucker. <laughs> After Paco is impressed by our dancing, he takes us to his room and he doesn't really want to talk about the apartment. Ah! 
We get the information we need by literally crushing his balls and... As we leave, Agent Nam and Jaden. Okay, this joke is getting old. Comes in to question Paco as well, but somebody has already killed him before they could talk. Now, this fight, it's bullshit. You need to be perfect in this battle, or else Norman is fucked later in the game because you can get one damn receipt. This kid's gonna die, and I'm going around in circles. Madison finds Ethan crying in his hotel room, either because he couldn't get the letters for the address, or because he shot someone. So, this could possibly turn into post-murder sex. Um, nom, 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 nom. After this, David Cage decided to create unnecessary drama and... Holy shit, where did the voice acting go? What kind of article were you gonna write? My life with a serial killer? No, no, no. How I caught the origami killer. Maybe you'll get a book deal. I hope it was fucking worth it! You can forgive Madison, and when she leaves the room, oh no, the cops are here. After you warn Ethan or not, a chase ensues, and it's boring. Holy fuck! Okay, you would most certainly die by doing that. Scott returns to his apartment to find Charles Kramer there, and they knock out him and Lauren. Time to escape drowning! Once him and Lauren are out, he goes on a rampage at Kramer Mansion. Oh, never mind, I failed. Madison just happens to find Anne Shepard, who has severe dementia. After being able to stir her memory by doing... origami, Madison gets the name of the origami killer. Oh my god. I never met that person. Ethan then goes through the final trial of the rat, where he must drink a vial of poison. He gives him the last letters, but he only has an hour to save Sean. Well, down the hatch! <laughs> Finding the address isn't too hard, so not much to say here. Oh look, an unwinnable chapter because I missed the only vital piece of evidence. Fuck you, David Cage. Scott sends Lauren to her mother's since things are getting too dangerous and he kisses her. You are a scumbag, Scott. And why? Oh, you all know why. Because Scott is only the origami killer. What a twist! Scott burns all the evidence he's collected from the parents, including Lauren, and then Madison comes in when he's gone, finding the address where Sean is. Well, that was a quick errand. After escaping a fire, Indiana Jones style, Madison gives the address to Norman, who she's never met. I've got to call that FBI guy Jaden. He's the only one I can trust. And heads there herself. Ethan finds Sean at the warehouse and Scott commends him, then gets angry when Ethan questions his morals. As Scott is about to shoot him, seriously, do you like him or not? Norman ninjas his way in and starts a fight with Scott. This fight is somewhat difficult, but not too bad. Meanwhile, outside, a police blockade is formed and Madison tries to get them to go away, which doesn't work. Oh shit, rewind. There we go. Ethan finally rescues Sean and David tries to fake us out twice. First that Sean has died, and then that the poison was real. It's not like everyone knew they would both live. Norman defeats Scott, who dies by falling into a grinder. No. Madison gets in and warns Ethan about the police, and they don't shoot because everyone is together and happy. Yay? Ethan and Madison start a new life together with Sean. Ethan, you can afford this all of a sudden? I guess you're poor if you're depressed and rich if you're happy. At least, that's what David fucking Cage thinks. Norman is hailed as a hero, stops using Triptocaine, but oh no, Arya has taken over his mind. And Lauren spits on Scott's grave for being a sick human being. In the end, was it all worth it? Statuette of Socks, one of the characters in my favorite video game. Let me say what we're all thinking. David Cage is a fucking self-absorbed creep. Now, is it okay to think your work is good? Absolutely. But David tries to pass off his work like they're the best things known to man. His short form work is actually pretty damn impressive, and I think he'd be a great short filmmaker, but his long work is full of plot holes, buggy gameplay, boring or nonsensical storylines, and poorly aged technology. I don't know how he's gotten David Bowie, Jesse Williams, Willem Dafoe, and Ellen Page to work with him. 
Oh wait, you you have the reason David Cage convinced Ellen to be in to Beyond Two Souls? Well, don't stand there. Tell me the reason. Okay, so... David Cage googled pictures from when she was a child to her 20s, wrote a script using those, sent her a copy of Heavy Rain and a letter telling her reasons why she should be Jody. then they met at a bar with just David, Ellen, and the casting director, and she said yes. The fuck? It didn't end up well for Ellen either, considering David is a homophobic, sexist, racist asshole. It was found out later that the developers made a nude model of her and placed it in the game's code. Then during the Quantic Dream harassment lawsuit, <coughs> David said, and I quote, You want to talk about homophobia? I work with Ellen Page, who fights for LGBT rights. You want to talk about racism? I work with Jesse Williams, who fights for civil rights in the USA. Judge me by my work. Okay, well, your work is shit and creepy. In fact, let's talk about how many times your female characters are assaulted and almost raped. Fahrenheit, 1. Heavy Rain, 4. Beyond Two Souls, 2. And Detroit Become Human, 1. Although, it's two characters. That's eight times female characters are sexually assaulted in your games, David. And to be honest, they're a bit gratuitous and not handled well. Also, with racism and homophobia, Fahrenheit, Beyond Two Souls, and Detroit are perfect examples of how not to handle that kind of stuff. The female lead needs a gay best friend, civil rights parallels done horribly, have the option to shoot two lesbian robots, holy shit, constant fucking tration camps, what the fuck, and Fahrenheit, oh, goddamn Fahrenheit. Oh, I am sorry to cause a wedding on you. Your presence here bring honor to my miserable shop. Just what are you trying to tell me here? That this guy is Superman? That's your excuse? And you seriously expect me to buy that crap? Oh, I love you too damn much, Sam. I wouldn't let you go for anything in the world. Look, if you want to play David Cage's game still, go ahead, but remember how fucking creepy and horrible of a man he is before you do. David, I judged you by your work, and your work is shit. So what do I give Heavy Rain? <laughs> Avoid it. Your friends may say it's the best story in a game ever written, or they might say David Cage is a genius. None of which is true. All of it has aged really badly, its story makes no sense, and it's written by a man whose ego is bigger than the games he promotes. Thank you for watching the Pixel Punch, and if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out 8-Bit Punches, and be sure to smash the X button, and up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, and have an amazing day. So, what's the next game on the list? Well, it... Can't be that bad. I mean, it has dinosaurs in it.